Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, I'm really, really happy to see some familiar faces. Some people I have seen for the first time in real life. This is a, it's been almost three years to the week since I gave a talk like this in person. So this is a treat for me, and I'm really glad you're here. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, if at any point you can't hear me, give me the secret signal. <laughs> So thank you uh, to the Tiger Library for hosting this talk. Thank you for all to you for your interest. Um, I'm going to be sharing uh, my family's history, my mom's family history during World War II. Uh, you'll see pictures uh, from my family archive. I will have video clips of talks that my mother has given. I'll be sharing some historical information. And what I'm hoping is that by the end of this talk, you will walk away and you will remember February 19th like I do as the day of remembrance and what lessons we can take from that history to apply to the present. So before I get started, show of hands, how many people know anything, even a little bit about Japanese American incarceration? Okay, just about everybody. How many of you learned about this in high school? One hand, two hands, maybe. For me, I took AP U.S. History, there was maybe one sentence. Um, anybody learn about it in college? One or two? Yeah. So I think it's in human nature for us to turn away from the dark, uh, dark sides of our, ourselves, whether it's personal, at a community level, or at a nation level. And what I want to do today is to shine a light on a dark period in U.S. history and my, my family's experience, which hopefully will bring it more to life than just names and dates, and why I think it's important. So my name is Toby Asai Loftus. This is my mom in camp with two of her brothers and my mom and my, and my grandmother. My mom has three sons. I'm the youngest. This is mom at her 89th birthday. She turns 91 in June. She's in great health. She is still driving. <laughs> she lives in Ashland, and she does drive to Portland and Hood River. Uh, maybe we wish she didn't, but you can't stop her. She and I went to Spain for two weeks in October. She's doing great. She's been, been giving talks like these, these since, well, as long as I can remember, kindergarten and on. So it's my privilege and my responsibility, I feel, to carry on this story. So how did my family, my mom's family, come to America? My grandparents here, if they were alive, grandpa would be 143 years old. Grandma would be 131. They came at the near the turn of the century. Uh, they had eight kids. Grandpa delivered seven of them at home. They were married for over 50 years and survived and thrived through, without question, the darkest period in U.S. history for Japanese Americans. Up until recently, only two of those eight children were still alive. My mom, who is the youngest, and her sister, Aunt Mika. Aunt Mika passed away in October when mom and I were in Spain at age 99. Her mind was still very sharp, but her body was tired. So mom is the only one of those eight children still alive. Here she is in 2019, the year before the pandemic. We made a pilgrimage to one of the concentration camps. This is in Park Mountain, Wyoming. And she is standing in the approximate location of the barrack they were incarcerated in. So how did my family come to America? My grandfather came to the United States in 1904. He was 24 years old at the time. He worked on the railroad. He worked in Hood River helping uh, orchardists. He didn't know how to grow, grow fruit. He was a rice farmer. And when he had amassed enough money to buy some substandard land and build a very ramshackle house, he wrote to his mom and said, I'm ready to be married. She sent him three or four or five pictures. He chose one. Grandma came over in 1911 in a boat with 40 picture brides. They landed in Seattle. This is them in 1911. They were married, and it's, it's hard to believe. 
Here are my grandparents with their two eldest children standing in front of my grandpa as my aunt uh, Masako, she was the eldest, and my grandmother is holding uh, uh, infant, my oldest uncle Taro or Tot. Here are my two oldest uncles, Tot, Tot is standing and Uncle Min is beside him. Behind them are the blossoming uh, uh, fruit, or, uh, fruit trees in Hood River. Here's my Aunt Mika, flanked by my Uncle Jean or Uncle Itsuo or Uncle Dick in the snowy winters of Hood River. Here's a rare photo showing the youngest and the eldest of the eight children. My mom is right in front of her, she, she's probably about three years old. And my Aunt Masako is in white standing next to my grandma. Aunt Masako grew up in Japan and died in World War II during the fire bombing of Nagoya. So my mom really didn't know Aunt Masako. Um, this is their only meeting and she died before you know, my mom could have known her. But this is a rare meeting. That's my uncle Tak, the eldest, and my uncle Itsu or Dick standing next to mom. Here's mom at about age six or seven with uh, three of her brothers and my grandparents. Uh, that last picture was 1939. So when World War II, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, actually two of my uncles were already in the service. My uncle Masaaki, who everybody knew as half short for half height because he's so short, and my oldest uncle Paro or Tot. And I'll let mom tell the story about their service or getting into the service. Well, the draft was on. And I don't know what was going on that we were having the draft in 1940 and 41, but they were draft, boys were being drafted. And my one brother, my first brother, half, had graduated from Hood River High School when he was 15. And he went to work for the railroad. And during the week, he'd work at the railroad gang and stay there. And on weekends, he'd come home. And then he did that for four years. And he was 19 when he came home with a paper for my dad to sign, and my dad said, what is this? He said, I want to volunteer in the Army, but I can't because I'm not enough old enough to be a volunteer. You have to sign. And my dad said, well, I don't know if I want to sign this. And he said, well, I'll so forge your signature if you don't. So my dad signed it, and off I half went. And that was June of 1941, six months before Pearl Harbor. So he was the first to go in. Next slide. This is my older bro oldest brother, Todd. And he uh, was drafted before Pearl Harbor. And they had to report to an induction center in Portland, which from Port Hood River to Portland was a good two-hour drive back then. Right after this, uh, Pearl Harbor, they also drafted Japanese-American boys. But since we were put on a curfew every night, we had to stay in our homes after 7 or 8 o'clock and could not leave our homes until 7 or 8 in the morning. And we had a restriction of a 10-mile radius. We could not be seen traveling in the daytime. And because they were drafted and had to report to Portland, which is more than 10 miles, and they would be breaking the curfew in many cases when they were moving, they had to have an escort. Each Japanese-American soldier had to have an escort taken to Portland to then ditch the so the curfew that mom is referring to was a curfew that was imposed on Japanese Americans. And if you know the story of Minoru Minyasui, he fought the constitutionality of that curfew all the way up to the Supreme Court and lost. Uh, he died in 1986, and in uh, 2015, he was awarded posthumously the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So where were, what happened to my family on December 7th, 1941? Well, most of the family was home at the farm and the orchard working, but my grandfather was downtown. He was at the Japanese community's hall, which you can see a picture here. He's in front. He's really short, even for Japanese Americans. And the story of what happened to him is kind of a tragic comedy. I'll let mom tell that story too. This is where my father was on Sunday, December 7th. He was down there with a group of people who were busily cleaning up the hall, getting ready for a big talent show that we were having to raise money for a flush toilet. 
we had, for a long time, had to walk down a long hill to the outhouses to do our business. And so they decided they'd like to install a, a flush toilet. And so they're raising money for it. Well, the police, the sheriff came and chased them all home, didn't explain anything. And my dad had no idea what was going on. And imagine if, to give, give an explanation, they said, well, we're going to have a talent show to raise money for a flush toilet. <laughs> well, they, of course, thought they were getting the place all cleaned up to have a big celebration over the attack on Pearl Harbor. So when he came home, he was all flustered, and we said, we heard on the radio about the Pearl Harbor attack, and I could see the face. Oh, my gosh. So, that so what happened to my mom? On Friday, before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, she was a teacher's pet. She had all these kids that she could play with. On Monday, uh, she showed up. Nobody would talk to her. No one would play with her. She was spat upon and called a dirty yellow jack. She was in fourth grade. So now we're going to jump forward to today, February 19th, 1941. Why is this the day of remembrance for Japanese Americans? It is a day on which Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. What does the year 9066 state? It gives the military the authority to designate a security area from which any or all persons may be excluded. Any or all persons. Notice it doesn't say anything about race or national origin or whether or not you're a citizen. Anything. No, any or all persons. So theoretically, the military could say, um, for security reasons, all Methodists must leave the state of Wyoming. Or all men over six foot tall have to leave Western Washington. Or, or whatever. They could, they could have justified anything, any or all persons. Now, it was only applied against Japanese Americans. Now, if you've attended any of my previous talks, you get to sit on your hands. How long was Executive Order 9066 in effect? World War II? Five years? Ten years? Anybody want to guess? Over 30 years. 30 years. Executive Order 9066 was rescinded in 1976 by Gerald Ford. So up until 1976, if the military wanted to, they could say, all these people have to be excluded from this zone that we define as a security risk. Gerald Ford, when rescinding it, said, we now know what we should have known then. Not only was that evacuation wrong, but Japanese Americans were and are loyal Americans. On the battlefield and at home, the names of Japanese Americans have been and continue to be written in history for the sacrifices and contributions they have made to the well-being and to the security of this, our common nation. <coughs> Now, part of the, uh, so the Executive Order 9066, was, which was, it was what led to the concentration camps, it also uh, created the WRA, the War Relocation Authority. This was the organization, organization that rounded up Japanese Americans, forced them to the homes, built the camps. The first director of the WRA was Milton Eisenhower. Does that name sound familiar? brother to Supreme Allied Commander and future U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. I highly recommend that you go onto YouTube and search for Milton Eisenhower and WRA, and you will see a stunning uh, newsreel narrated by him about the camps, uh, very propagandistic. So, Based on uh, Executive Order 9066, the military designated the entire West Coast as Exclusion Zone 1. Half of Washington, half of Oregon, half of California, although it has expanded to, uh, to be all of California, parts of Arizona, Hawaii, and, and Alaska. This was the zone from which anybody who was Japanese American had to leave. They were kind of hoping people would do it on their own. It would be a lot easier to self-evacuate, was the word they used. 
But how many of you could just pick up things and just leave the state? Very few people did, which led to the forced removal. So posters like this went up all over cities, all up and down the western coast. Now, it's too hard to see. It is instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry. I don't think I can see. Well, maybe I can. I don't know if you can read this. All persons of Japanese ancestry, both alien and non-alien. What's non-alien? A citizen. Why would you call somebody a non-alien? Right, right. So, and now you might think, even if we corrected that and said alien and citizen, you might think that was fairly straightforward. But it wasn't. My grandparents had lived peacefully and legally as aliens in the United States for over 30 years. Racist anti-Asian laws forbade Asians from becoming naturalized citizens. So although their children, like my mom and my aunts and uncles, were US citizens by birth, my grandparents did not become naturalized citizens. It wasn't until 1952, with the passage of the McCarran-Walters Act, that uh, Asians could finally become naturalized citizens. By then, Grandpa was 72 and Grandma was 60. They never became naturalized citizens. So already we see the euphemisms that are being used to describe aspects of this uh, history. And I would like to take a little diversion to talk about these euphemisms and suggest or challenge those euphemisms and suggest what I think are more alternative, more accurate alternatives. So you heard in uh, Gerald Ford's talk, he talked about the evacuation. So the forced removal of families from the homes was referred to the relocation or the evacuation. Evacuation usually means to leave or to be removed from an area of danger, maybe a, a natural disaster, a flood, or fires, or a hurricane, or maybe it's a war, a civil war. This was not for their safety. This was not an evacuation or a relocation that was so benign. This was a forced removal, an exile. Uh, yeah, that should, I'm guessing you don't have any uh, difficulty with that change. Again, yes. How long were they given to, for example, down in Portland? I was never clear on how long were they given to evacuate. To the question is, how long were they given to evacuate? Yeah, to get rid of their things, like the end of the expo, right? Around there, expo yard? We'll get to that. All right. um, in many cases, I think it was only uh, maybe weeks, a couple of weeks. I don't have the exact rate. So the people who were impacted are sometimes called evacuees and in internees. Um, Again, I, I reject those terms. I suggest they were prisoners, inmates. Um, they were first sent to temporary uh, camps called assembly centers. Now, when I think of assembly, I think of something benign, maybe a church group getting together for a charity event. Maybe it's a political rally, or a high school <coughs> pep rally, a pep assembly. Does the word assembly conjure up barbed wire, guard towers, armed guards, and searchlights? I think not. I think it should be fairly easy to accept that we should reject that term and call them temporary detention centers or temporary prison camps. Now we get to the big one. Almost every time I hear about this and read about them, they're called internment camps. Has anybody heard the word internment in any context other than the incarceration of Japanese Americans. Well, that's internment. To be internment. I hear that too. Um, that's a little bit more permanent. So, in the courts, you're, you're interred, you're incarcerated. So, internment has a legal definition. It has to do with the imprisonment of enemy aliens, of prisoners of war, and political prisoners. Now, there were no charges ever leveled against any Japanese Americans and certainly no, uh, no convictions. And how many cases of sabotage or espionage were, uh, were Japanese Americans uh, accused of? Zero. Zero cases of sabotage and espionage. So 
I reject the word internment because it's the only time you ever hear the word usually is referring to the Japanese American experience. So how can that be descriptive? So for years I called them incarceration camps. And more recently I'm starting to call them, which is controversial, including with my mother, concentration camps. Now, a lot of people are very uncomfortable using the word concentration camp in a context outside of the Holocaust in Europe. And I respect that. I totally get that. And in res out of respect for my Jewish brothers and sisters and friends, I understand if you won't accept this. But let me make my case. A concentration camp, by the de definition, is a, an imprisonment of people at a high concentration rate. For me, what happened in Europe was an, an almost inconceivable horror extreme where people were sent there to be killed, to be exterminated. So I refer to those extermination camps or death camps. Concentration camps existed before World War II, and they certainly have happened after World War II, and I think it does a disservice to say you can only use the word concentration camp to apply to the Holocaust in Europe. You may not agree with me, and I respect that. A couple more arguments uh, to support my premise. The word concentration camp was used by members of FDR's administration. Secretary of Navy wrote to President uh, Roosevelt saying uh, plans for concentration camps. The Attorney General, Francis Biddle, talked about loyal American citizens in concentration camps. Leland Ford, communicating with Secretary of War Henry Stimson, talked to, wanted to know if concentration camps are going to be set up for Japanese in the interior. So if you're still not comfortable, OK. Maybe I can invite you to call them incarceration camps. But I would invite you to challenge the term internment camp whenever you see it in writing or hear it. OK, let's get back to the story. So we have 120,000 people to be forced from their homes on the West Coast. So how do you do that? Well, you, they go by bus. These are Japanese Americans from Bainbridge Island being boarded, uh, boarding a train in Seattle. Notice the soldier with the bayonet and the rifle. This is a very famous photo of a two-year-old girl waiting to board the train uh, to Manzanar in Southern California. Every family was assigned a family number. Mom was a fourth grader. She'll never forget this number, 16339. You make paper tags and each piece of your bag, which you could only carry, take what you could carry, and each person had to wear a tag like this. Watch the next video clips of my mom, and if you look closely, you'll see she is wearing a paper tag, a, re a replica, to remember this. So this gentleman is asking how much time you had Very, but give it maybe two weeks. Two weeks, you have to clear up all your uh, effects, uh, square away all your assets and your affairs, and you can only take what you can carry. You can imagine in that sort of chaos, the fire sales. I have to sell my car, I have to lease my home, I have to lease my farm, and the kind of gouging and swindling that would occur under those circumstances. Oh, and um, any of you pet lovers, can't take your pets. You have to leave them. <coughs> There's a heartbreaking story I read it, uh, uh, about a dog that ran after the car of his family, and when the car didn't, when the family never returned, he was so upset he he refused to eat and died. So you've got so this is the uh, path a map showing the journey my family took. They started in Hood River at the Red Dock, and they're put on trains to Pineville which is uh, an assembly center in California. They were there for about three or four months. Then they were transferred to the Thule Lake concentration camp, which is just south of the border, about five, 10 miles south of Planet Falls. They were there for about a year. I'm not sure why. They were transferred then to Park Mountain, which is just about 10 minutes out of Cody, Wyoming. They were there for a couple years until they were allowed to leave, and they came back to the river. So mom's a fourth grader. She's all excited. 
She doesn't understand what's going on. This is her first train trip. They get on the train, and they're ordered to close the blinds, and soldiers are stationed in any car with a rifle with a bayonet. They have no idea where they were going. They have no idea how long the train ride would last. They certainly have no idea when they get to come home, if they get to come home. Not a very fun train ride. So, we've got 120,000 people to incarcerate. The permanent uh, relocation centers were not ready. So they had to house or imprison the people in temporary camps they called assembly centers. What were assembly centers? Uh, old army barracks that were no longer in use, air grounds. Here's some examples. Here's Puyallup. This was Camp Harmony. Looks lovely, doesn't it? This was in the uh, the Western Washington Fairgrounds. One inmate called it living, like living in, quote, nothing more than a shed on a kid, chicken ranch. This was the Portland Assembly Center. This is in North Portland. It was housed in the Pacific International Livestock Expo. There was very little ventilation. Temperatures reached 107. And you can only imagine the stench from animal droppings and the flies. This is where Minya Sui's family was. The biggest assembly center was, and largest and longest occupied was in Santa Anita. This is the guard tower. And people were housed in the horse stalls. I don't care how vigorously you clean a horse stall. In the heat of the summer, the stench was unbearable. To add insult to injury, there were over 18,000 people incarcerated here, 15,000 mattresses. If you were late, you got to stuff your own mattress with uh, straw. Oh, and the showers, there were 150. So if you're fast with math, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, there were 150. So that's did I do this right? About one per 150 persons? 115 showers per 18,000 people? I don't know. I may have screwed it up. But it's not very many. My family was sent to Pinedale, which is outside of one, near Fresno, California, and it was relatively nice. Instead of using existing uh, barracks or, or structures, they built new barracks. And these barracks were actually used as a template for the barracks that would be used in the more permanent relocation centers. Uh, but the temperature did get up to 120, 125 degrees. So if you're from Hood River or Washington State, you can imagine how unbearable that was. Waiting in line, many people died, uh, died, but fainted from, from the heat. So mom has a very vivid memory of uh, the uh, Pinedale Assembly Center. This is a, a typical guard tower that's around the camps. Um, there, in Pinedale, there were four, one in each corner. And every night, there was a huge searchlight that you could see in a used car lot that would sweep over the, over the camp. And although I was a happy child and had a happy face, I didn't realize how much these things were indelibly placed in my brain until I moved from Pinedale Assembly Center to Tule Lake Relocation Center where there were no searchlights going around the camp. But as I lay in bed, I could feel it. Because I used to count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And when I got to Tule Lake, there was no searchlight and I still was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's how the subtle influences of such things. I was able to find a photograph of a searchlight from Pinedale Assembly Center, and I can only wonder if this was the one that kept my mom up and haunted her nights. So after three or four months at Pinedale, the uh, concentration camps were completed, and my family was transferred to Tule Lake, California, as I said, just south of the California border. This is a census showing my mom's family, uh, parents, a couple of um, uh, my aunt Nika, a couple of uncles, and herself. This is a map showing the Tule Lake uh, concentration camp, and I'm pointing at the uh, cell. So 
Here you see we are in block 67, barrack number 15, units C and D. So here's block 67. I'm pointing at barrack number 15. Uh, they are subdivided in about four or five units, and they had two units because they had a larger family. Uh, at so here's a photograph of the Tar River barracks and the people in Tule Lake. So what was life, life like in the camps? Here's the interior of a typical barrack. They were slab dash constructions. It was basically wood slats with bar paper. That's it. No insulation. No foundation. Gaps in the walls. It got extraordinarily hot in the summer, very cold in the winter, and when the dust storms would blow, even if you tried to block out all the gaps, everything would be covered with dust. The only furnishings you had were two lights originally and a bare light bulb that changed. Anything else you saw in there was something they scrounged or built together or, or some you know something they should put together. Uh, meals were served in mess halls like this. It's just basically a barrack without any uh, subdivisions. The food was very substandard. I've read government reports from that time that say that the food was unsuitable for children. All the jobs on the camp were uh, manned by the incarcerees. Here's the camp PX, the, the store. Uh, how would you like to use a toilet like this for three years? No partitions, no privacy, no dignity. You could rub elbows with the person next to you for three years or more. It was humiliating, inhumane. And for the older people, particularly the older uh, men and women, it was so embarrassing and uncomfortable, they might try and hold it to go late at night or early in the morning. Same with the showers, there was no walls or, or privacy. You can't do that, that's, that's not healthy. There are stories of people getting cardboard, they're building big cardboard boxes that they kind of wore and carried into the bathroom just for some semblance of dignity and privacy. This is what they got to do. All the jobs, as I said, were manned by incarcerees, doctors, dentists, the laundry. There was one job you could not do as an incarceree, and that was you can't be a teacher. They run in Caucasian teachers to teach the children. And every day, the children recite the Pledge of Allegiance behind barbed wire. Mom remembers this distinctly. High school dances. And as I said, it got very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer, and Mom has a distinct memory of that. Notice the big gaps between the rows. That's a fire break, and she's going to talk about the fire break. And there's a picture of the, the camp on all the barracks, and you can see the fire breaks in between that they had so that if these tar paper uh, buildings caught fire, we wouldn't all burn up, you know, it's the fire break would prevent it from going across. And in the winter, we had snow blizzards and oh, going to school, you weren't allowed to wear pants then, you know, if you're girls, you had to wear skirts and dresses. And to go across those fire breaks with a snow blizzard just coming against your legs, I would run and I would crouch down, cover my legs, <laughs> and then I'd get up and run some more. And I, I still have a very vivid memory of that. So here's a photograph of present day Tule Lake and somebody holding a photograph of the Tule Lake uh, Concentration Center so you can get an idea there. Look at the number of barracks. As I said, initially the food was just horrible, mostly canned veggies and fruits and stuff. And what they ended up doing was building big victory gardens outside of the fences of the camps. And so people were allowed to go outside the camps and cultivate, and these were very successful. Um, not only did they supply fresh vet, uh, vegetables and produce for the incarcerees, but they often made surpluses that were shared with the surrounding community. In, in Hart Mountain, Wyoming, they constructed a root cellar so big that you can see literally a truck can drive through it. Here's what they look like today. There's a big capital campaign to try and make these safe enough that people can go in and check them out. But this is an extraordinary accomplishment, all built by the prisoners. 
Now, after a year of housing and feeding 120,000 people, the military and the government said, no, this is costing us a lot of money, and we really need able-bodied men to, to serve in the armed forces. And we know there's people here who are loyal. How are we going to figure that out? So in their infinite wisdom, they came up with a loyalty questionnaire. Everybody 18 and older had to answer these questions. Many of the questions were very benign. Where did you go to school? What clubs and hobbies you have? But the big questions were questions 27 and 28. Question 27. Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? How many of you would be willing to do that? Now, think about my grandfather. He's 62, and he's not a citizen because he can't become a citizen. So that's kind of an unusual question to ask him. Question 28 was even more problematic. It starts off, okay, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America? So far, so good. But look at the second clause. Do you forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization? Does anybody know the definition of forswear? I had an idea. I wasn't sure. Anybody? Is it, is it that you've already sworn and the forswear is to avoid it? Very good. Forswear means to renounce. No. So clearly, they were hoping you would answer yes to both of these questions and indicate that you're a loyal citizen. But if you answered yes to question number 28, couldn't that be construed to say, I used to um, pledge allegiance to the Japanese emperor, but I've rejected that now. My grandparents and family had no intention of going back to Japan. They had no allegiance to Japan. And so you can imagine how insulted and upset many people were to be asked these questions. And I can respect every opinion. My grandfather, he was a Zen Buddhist, he said, this is not a time to be proud. I'm answering yes, yes, and he's trying to encourage others to do it. Others said, heck no, look at us. We're citizens. We've been forced from a home from behind barbed wire. Why the heck should I serve in an army for a country that would do this to me? I know my constitutional right. Screw you. Some people answered yes conditionally. Yes, as soon as you let my family free. Not allowed. You couldn't do, come on in. Please, there's plenty of chairs. Yeah, don't be shy. Um, you couldn't answer yes qualified. Anything yes qualified was equal to a no. And what really confused the military is when people answered yes to one question and no to the other. <laughs> they couldn't understand why would someone do that. And if you answered no to either question, they called you in trying to persuade you to change your answer. <laughs> so if you were in Thule Lake and you answered yes, yes, you were considered loyal and you were moved to a different camp. That's why my family was moved from, Har uh, from Thule Lake to Harp Mountain. If you answered no, no, and could not be persuaded to change your answers, all the people who answered no, no from all the other 10 camps were moved to Thule Lake. The population of Tule Lake exploded from 8,000 to over 19,000. Now, if you can imagine 19,000 people who've answered no, no, and are steadfast in their answers, they were not happy. Tule Lake became the worst of the worst. They increased the number of guard towers from 6 to 28. They increased the height of the barbed wire fences to 8 feet high. They brought in 1,000 MPs with armored vehicles and uh, tanks. And they built a stockade, a prison within a prison. Those walls still stand today. And if you look at them closely, you can see graffiti scratched in the wall in Japanese and English. So when people who know a little bit about this history know that my family is in Tulu Lake, they're like, oh, that was really bad. For better or worse, my family was moved out of the camp before it became as bad as it did become. So my family was moved to Hart Mountain, Wyoming. The train trip from Tule Lake took them straight up to Columbia River Gorge and across. They stopped the train on the Washington side of the river, across from Hood River, and brought in fresh apples from Hood River. My family couldn't eat them. They were too hard for me. This is a census from uh, Hart Mountain, Wyoming. You can see my, my family listed on the first column aside. 
Here's a picture of Heart Mountain in the distance with the parents and the wide fire break as mom talked about before. There's mom in a Christmas package on the far right with a microphone. She likes to joke that once they gave her a mic, she didn't stop talking. I'm grateful for that. The vast majority of people who experienced him never talked about it. Many family members never learned about their family's experience until after they died and they came across pictures and stories. Now, we should talk about what my mom's experience at camp was compared to that of her siblings and her parents. Mom was a great school girl. She didn't understand what was going on in the greater scheme of things. At home in Hood River, she walked mile and a half to school. At the end of school, she walked home, and then she worked in the orchard and the farm. She didn't have play dates. Whereas in camp, she had all this free time, all these kids her age to play with. She had a good time. See, she's sitting there smiling, sitting with a couple of friends on the barrack steps. Her trauma came after they came home. So here she is, smiling in front of a couple of my aunt uncles, my grandmother. You can see the shadowy uh, tower of guard, guard tower in the background. Here's a map of the uh, Heart Mountains camp superimposed, superimposed over the existing today farmland. And you see a little blue dot on the top, top left corner. That was my mom's barrack. The camp was over a mile across. It was huge. In fact, it was the third largest city in the state of Wyoming at the time. Third largest city in Wyoming. So what was the experience like for my aunts and uncles and my parents? Well, that was a lot darker. Third from the uh, right in the back row is my uncle Gene. He graduated from high school while in Heart Mountain. What's going to become of us? Can I go to school? Will I be able to get a job? Will we be able to go home? Will we have a home to go home to? Will my uncle, my brothers who are serving in the army, will they will they be killed or or uh, grievously maimed in the war? So the difference in experience for my mom, who is a fourth to seventh grader in camp, was very different from that of her siblings. So. Now we're getting to the end of incarceration, and Mom's going to talk about that. When we were in Heart Mountain, our hometown newspaper had a full-page paid advertisement every week. It just was a weekly newspaper then. And it had a paragraph or two of, Japs are not wanted in Hood River. Don't come home. We'll make life miserable for you if you do. And then there were columns and columns of names of people we had known all our lives. The minister, the dentist, most of our neighbors, not all. And they had signed this petition and there were something like seven or eight weeks of these full page paid advertisements. And I, if you don't think that is frightening, discouraging, my mother was looking at those, and she was so frightened that when my brother Min said to my dad, my brother Min said, wait a minute, it might be too dangerous to go home. So two of my buddies and I are going to go to Hood River first and check it out. So Ray Sato, Sat Noji, and my brother, who were all in Chicago at the time, went home. And they were greeted at the train station with an unwelcoming committee who tried to put their baggage back on the train. Well, they stayed. And then my brother wrote to my dad and said, if you are planning to bring the kids, meaning me and Dick and mom home, you better come fast because the Selective Service uh, Department is going to change my army classification from whatever it was that, uh, if you had two sons in the army already, the next one was deferred, and he had been deferred. But they were going to change his clarification to 1A so they could draft him and get rid of him. And that's exactly what they did. But Ray Saro had flat feet, <laughs> or heart trouble, and Sat had whatever the other was. So they didn't get to send them off, just my brother left. So here's my Uncle Ben on the left that Mom was talking about. And then my Uncle Gene, who graduated in camp, 
So I have four uncles serving actively in World War II in the Pacific Theater while the rest of the family was incarcerated. So what are some of those examples of those unwelcoming articles? No James wanted in Hood River. James is a con combination of Japanese and apes. Nevertheless, the day came when they were allowed to leave Heart Mountain. And so here's Mom and my Uncle Dick, all smiles at the vocation Heart Mountain train depot just outside of the camp. When Mom and I returned to Heart Mountain in 2019, we found Vocation Lane, which we guess is close to where that uh, depot used to be. And in the distance, you can see a barrack, uh, a reconstructed barrack that's part of the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, which I highly recommend if you are ever in Wyoming, it's just 10 minutes outside of Cody, go. There are exhibits, and it's, it's fantastic. So Mom's family was one of the first families to return to Hood River from camp. Here's my Aunt Nika. Here's my, my grandfather pouring water on the tractor. And here's my grandma smiling with a hoe. And these photographs were actually used as propaganda. I'll let my mom tell that story. There's my sister hoeing. Next, there's my father and my brother Jean showing the, the very uh, nice fruit trees. <coughs> And these photos were all taken by the War Relocation Authority, which was in charge of the whole program of taking us from our homes into the camps and trying to help us re-establish um, ourselves in our homes after we were released. Next. And there's my mother. Next. <coughs> There's my mother and father with the fruit trees in Hood River and my brother Jean. Next. Oh, and we found out that those photos were taken sort of for propaganda purposes because the, the people who were still in the camps were afraid to go home. And they were not leaving the camps like the government wanted them to. So they were trying to give them encouragement to leave. So they took pictures of us like that happily relocated in our homes. Well, what they didn't know is what we were going through, although these are happy looking pictures. Um, some friends of ours said, oh, we saw these pictures of your dad pouring water in the tractor and your mom with a hoe and everything. They were put up in the camps to be, show the rest of the Japanese people they should go get out of the camp and go home. So what was the reality of what they came home to? Most West Coast cities, oh, here's a stamp on the back of one of those photographs, photographic section of the War Relocation Authority. Most cities on the West Coast did not want the Japanese to return. Most major cities on the West Coast, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, had a Japantown, a Nihonmachi. Most of those cities are now called Chinatown, or the International District, because when the Japanese were forced out, other immigrant groups came in and the Japanese were not welcome to return. So this is a sign somebody put up in California. I won't dignify this by reading the fine text of this Japanese hunting license. And here is the honor roll for Hood River. And that was a notorious story that made national news. I'll let mom tell that story. This is a picture of the honor roll. I better tell you about that. How's my time, Toby? Okay. Um, there was an honor roll in almost every town where they put the servicemen's names up. And in 1944, there were 16 Japanese American boys' names up there, two of them being my brother, brothers. And the American Legion Post erased those 16 names. And my brother, my oldest brother, was in the Battle of the South Coral Sea when the tide turned in our favor in the war, and he marched into Manila uh, in the Philippines right behind the Marines who went in first. He got his first copy of Stars and Stripes in weeks, and he reads on the front page that his name was removed from the honor roll in Hood River, Oregon. This was really great for my morale. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that those 16 names had been erased, and the first thing I did on April 20th, 1945, the day we returned from home, 
to at home, it snowed in Hood River. And I thought, oh, oh, this is an omen. But the first thing I did was to look at this honor roll to see if my brother's names were back up. Because the American Legion, when they erased those names, Hood River, Oregon got national publicity for the first time in its history in the New York Times saying they did this. So the National American Legion said, you put those names back. And they said, we're not gonna. And the headquarters said, you put those names back or you're going to lose your charter. And they said, okay, we'll put them back, but only because we don't want to lose our charter. So they did. However, they had scrubbed their names so hard off that the wood was rough and they couldn't paint their names back on. So they had to get little pieces of board and write their names on them and hang them. So the 16 names stood out from all the rest. <laughs> so this, this story was called the Hood River Incident. And it's been a black mark for many years. 78 years after, on Veterans Day, last November, the Hood River chapter of the American Legion formally apologized. And they pulled out a box of letters they had received from all over the country, vast majority, majority from that time condemning them for their actions. Those letters will be digitized and publicized. But most businesses had no Jap trade signs in their windows. This is a fellow a barber in Kent, Washington. And mom had to walk past a store with that sign. But there were a few allies. Here is Reverend Sherman Burgoyne. He wrote a blistering condemnation in the letter to the editor about the removal of the names. Our neighbors, Carl and Hazel Smith, dear, dear friends and allies, helped protect our farm from people who would try and take it over or destroy it. And Mom has a story about them. Not all the people in Hood River signed that petition, but it came with great sacrifice. Our good neighbors, Carl and Hazel Smith, were two of about eight or ten people I can name to you today as people who stood right up and befriended us called us up to see if they need, could do anything for us that we needed. But Hazel had a cousin who had the store one mile from my house that I passed every day on the way to school and on the way to church. And there was a no job trade sign in his window on the door. Ralph Sherub came to our house in, in May of 1942 before we left for camp with tears in his eyes to say goodbye and he gave us an address book and said, be sure to write me a letter. But when we got home, he had a no jab trade sign in his window, door, and I had to pass that every day. And when Hazel, when my brother Min first went to Hood River to check things out, he stayed with the Smiths because our house was not vacated yet. And so during that time, she went into the store, her cousin's store, and Ralph said, um, Hazel, I don't like the way you're dealing with this Jap situation. She said, why don't you just come right out and say you don't approve of Min Asai living in my house? Well, I don't care to do business with you any longer. And she walked out. And she never had relations with her cousin, Ralph Sher until death, they both died. So if most, most businesses in town won't do business with you, including buying gas, they sometimes had to drive to D, Oregon to get gas. What happens if you need help, if you like the mechanic help? Here's a story about that. And we had a really hard time, with, especially with hardware and mechanic work which for farmers was a real hardship. And our tractor broke down in the middle of harvest, and we figured out that it was the magneto. So we took it out, and I thought, well, how are we going to get the tractor going again? 
And my father said, you know, Orman Hukari owns a machine shop on the corner of the, uh, about a mile or two from our house. Why don't you take it down there? It was my brother in high school and me who did all the business of the, of the farm because my mother and father stayed on the farm, didn't go anywhere because the one time they went to town, it was so miserable, they just didn't want to face it anymore. So my brother and I went to Orman because my father said when Orman was five years old, he asked my father if he could pick strawberries for him. My parents raised a lot of strawberries at one time. And my father said, well, you're too young, you'll pull the stems out and so on. And he cried so much, my father said, okay. And he hired him. So he said, maybe Orman will help us. By now, Orman was grand, exalted ruler of the Elks Lodge. And when we got there, he said, I don't own, I don't run the machine shop. I only own the building and I lease it to this man and I know he will not work on your tractor. But I'll tell you what, you bring it and hide it after dark and hide it under the shrub in front of my gas station and tomorrow morning I'll get it and take it to him and get him to fix it and I won't tell him who it belongs to. We were so desperate, we did that. And then we went back every night after dark to see if the magneto would be under the bush. And each day of the harvest, it was just, we were frantic to get that tractor going. That's the sort of thing we went through. And there's good people like Carl and Hazel, who, uh, that's what you need to be, Carl and Hazel Smiths. That's my message always. So we've been talking about what was happening to my family, but what was happening to mom? She was a seventh grader. She was in middle school at the Barrett School. The Barrett School is no longer there. There's a house there, but this outbuilding is part of the original school. Uh, my, call, my cousins say they used to roller skate there. Mom would walk every day about a mile and a quarter, mile and a half to that school. What did she experience? So I walked to and from school and Every day, half mile down the road, Mrs. Spetsworth would be waiting for me. Mrs. Spetsworth is a woman who had two daughters who were grown and gone. And when I'd come home from school in the first, second, third grade, I'd stop at her place, play in her tire swing. She'd serve me a glass of milk and cookies. It's a very happy memory. But when I came home, she was at the road yelling at me, go back where you came from, you dirty yellow Jap. Or she, and she'd stick her dog at me. And I knew how obedient her dogs were because I have known her for several years before. I was so frightened. I, every time, there was a deep ditch in front of her house. And I walked in the ditch because there were high weeds. And I thought, I was short, and the weeds were high. I thought, maybe she won't see me. But she was watching her clock, waiting for me every day. So every day in the morning, every afternoon on my way home, she'd be there to yell at me and to stick her dog at me. And I used to think... I wish that dog would just bite me and get it over with. But I decided I'd try to overcome the power of that dog. He'd come snarling and showing his teeth out at me, and I'd look straight ahead because I knew if I looked at him, he could see fear in my face when it would bite me. And I just, I thought if I run, it's going to chase me and bite me. So I decided I'm going to walk slowly and look forward. So I put one shoe ahead of the other to touch and do like this so that I couldn't go very fast. And the dog never bit me, but boy, I wish it just got done it and got it over with. And um, so the power of combined <laughs> and the will to overcome a dog's bite. Mom continued to suffer through high school with the social isolation Oh, I, I decided to walk the path from my mom's home to the Barrett School and church, and here's that ditch she tried to walk in. The original house is no longer there, uh, but yeah. So as I said, she was socially shunned and suffered real isolation through high school. Um, so that was happening. And what was happening to me? I was so excited about going home I was 14, 13 in the seventh grade, 
And I was going home to the place where I had all these friends I went to school with from the first to the fourth grade. And when I got home, I found none of them would have anything to do with me. So I walked a mile and a little quarter to school every day, back, alone. Nobody played with me at recess. No one would speak to me in the classroom except the teacher. And on Sundays, I would walk a mile and a half to the close enough church. And I would sit in a pew by myself. I found out because nobody else would sit with me. So I, instead of sitting in the long pews in the center, I started sitting in the short pews on the side so as not to take up so much space. But I sat there thinking, I'm going to sit in a long pew in the middle one of these days anyway. <laughs> but I didn't do it. So it was a tough time for me in the ages 13 to 15. When I got to high school, I couldn't date, I couldn't go to the dances. I could, but there were two Japanese boys in the, in the high school, and I didn't want to go with them. And if I did go with them, I'd have to dance with them all evening, and nobody else would dance with me. So what's the use? I had a crush on a Caucasian boy, and I thought for the Sadie Hawkins dance, uh, there's my chance. <laughs> but as I thought about it, because of the social pressures, he probably would refuse. And I would never know if he didn't like me or he was afraid. And I didn't want to embarrass him. So I gave up the idea. So I never went to a dance until I was at the University of Oregon. I had my first date when I was a, a freshman in the university. <laughs> So following in the steps of my mother, I walked the extra quarter mile to the church. This was the church where no one would sit on a pew with mom. At the end of service, when you're exiting the, the church and the minister is greeting you, when my mom would come up to him, he would turn his face away. So the, the, the isolation, I mean, the isolation and the shunning was just so terrible. My mom said, this sucks being Japanese. I, I want to be 200% American. So her birth name was Mitsuko, which everybody mispronounces Mitsuko. So she unilaterally changed her name to Mitsi in the ninth grade without telling her family. So here's her previous uh, report card with Mitsuko, and the next one that says Mitsi. Her dad looked at it, he smiled. He looked at her, smiled, didn't say a word. Mom changed her name herself in the ninth grade. Now, because I don't have, I could talk for hours, but I can't do that here. So I'm going to jump forward 35 years. In 1980, a congressional committee was formed, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. They had hearings and recorded over 750 testimonies of people who had been incarcerated during World War II. Some of them were telling the story for the very first time in their life. The report that came out of it was titled, Personal Justice Denied. And the conclusion was that the uh, decision to incarcerate was based on, quote, racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. In 1990, uh, 1988, the Civil Liberties Act was passed, which gave surviving Japanese Americans reparations and a formal written letter signed by the president. This is one of my mom's most prized possessions. I mean, every country has dark histories, dark chapters. Most countries would never apologize. To have an apology is a pretty big deal for us. So. How, how is this relevant today? How, how does this history inform or instruct us about today? Well, I'm sure that you've all seen and read news about the horrible rise in anti-Asian violence and racism. Um, but here's some examples of, well, here's some examples. When the pandemic relief programs came out, they specifically ignored and excluded undocumented immigrants. Up to 74% of those people work, in, uh, work as quote-unquote essential workers. They pay taxes, 
and many have children who are U.S. citizens. A veteran newscaster, a news anchor, shared that she enjoyed dumplings on meters. Quote, that's what Koreans do. A viewer responded saying that, quote, I kind of take offense to that. I don't think it's appropriate she said that. She's being very Asian. She can keep her Korean to herself. If a white person said that, they would get fired. A tenured University of Pennsylvania law professor so fears in an interview saying, uh, talking about, quote, the danger of dominance of the Asian elite. I think the United States is better off with fewer Asians and less Asian immigration. So I want to share with you a few resources for those of you who are interested in learning more about this history. Online, there's the Densho online encyclopedia and densho.org. Fantastic repository of photos, documents, uh, video recordings of people who lived through this experience. The concentration camps, most of them have Facebook pages and web, web pages. Uh, many of them have pilgrimages every year or every two years. If you like podcasts, I love listening to podcasts. There's the Order 9066 podcast. It's a fantastic uh, series. And I myself have a blog with a page called February 19th, Day of Remembrance. It's tobyloftus.com slash links, or you can use the QR code. I update it regularly. When this recording is done, it will be linked there. You will find recordings of talks my mom is, and, Dad, and I have given. Uh, newsreel clips, lots of stuff. How about books? Well, fortunately, there's a lot more available today than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Here's just a few. Stubborn Twig is an award-winning book by Lauren Kessler. It tells the story of Minya Sui and his family. Um, excellent book. Tule Lake is a, uh, is a historical novel by Ed Miyakawa. He was incarcerated at Tule Lake, and you will get good descriptions of just how bad it got there. If you're into military history, Robert Asashina's excellent Just Americans is well-researched. Um, I'm not a huge military history buff, but I was riveted. Um, the story about how Senator, Senator Danny Nui lost his arm, I will never forget. Uh, Linda Tota is a professor at Willamette University and a native of Hood River. Like me, she's third generation. She has written many books and interviewed many people and taken personal accounts. This is just one of her books, Nisei's Shoulders Break Their Silence, Coming Home to the River. The cover has a photo of four soldiers, one of them is one of my uncles. And you probably see my, mom, my mom's family names every 10 or so pages. Not why I'm recommending it. Any book by her is excellent. A Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet is a lovely novel set in Seattle about a, Jap a Chinese American boy who prevented a Japanese American girl. It's, uh, it takes place in and around the Panama Hotel. And then my own, my mom's own memoir, self-published, self-printed, made in Japan and sold in Oregon. Uh, she published it in 1990. I have a few copies if you want to buy one afterwards, we can talk. And if I run out, she would be more than happy to uh, mail you a signed copy. I have just given one to the Tigard Library, so you can check it out there. Don't buy it online, at least now. Any copies you find online will be used and way overpriced. Talk to me, I'll get you a copy. And my oldest brother and I are working on a new version of it. Not sure when it will come out. You'll find out about it if you look at my website. Places to actually visit. Go to the actual concentration camp sites. I've been to uh, Tule Lake, uh, Minidoka, which is near Twin Falls, Idaho. I have cousins who are there, and Hart Mountain in Wyoming. Manzanar apparently has a very good one. I would love to go to that. The Panama Hotel in Seattle. If you ever go to Seattle, go to the Panama Hotel. Go to the tea room. There's a hole in the floor with plexiglass showing a room where Japanese families stored their belongings in the rush to leave the camps. They tried to repatriate a lot of those belongings, but Many they can't, it's, it's eerie, it's look, like looking through a window in time. I have not been to the Pinedale Remembrance Fre uh, Plaza in Fresno, California. I want to visit that. If you go to Eugene, right next door to the whole Performing Center of Arts is the uh, Japanese American Memorial. It's lovely. And if you look at the stones, uh, you'll see my mom and name in at least two of those stones. 
As for museums, we have some excellent ones here. The Historic History Museum of the River, I just visited it last uh, November, is excellent. JMO, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon here in Portland, formerly the Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center, I believe. Excellent, excellent. I have not been to the museums in LA, San Jose, or Seattle, but I will, and I recommend you do too. How can you be a Carl or a Hazel Smith? This is a call to action. We have to be able, we can, we can and must be better than we are. So how do you do that? I highly recommend the Right to Be, formerly Hollaback training. It's online, it's free at righttobe.org. They provide bystander intervention training, uh, how to prevent and respond to harassment and conflict de-escalation. Now, that may sound a little scary, but I can tell you that the director of this library, it's 5-1, she took the training and she applied it. She, I think, Halsted would speak highly of this training too. LinkedIn Learning has some excellent anti-racism uh, training, but it's expensive. However, if you come to the Tiger Library, and probably your public library, they have LinkedIn Learning accounts you can use. Highly recommended. I recommend you check out Harvard's uh, uh, Project Implicit. It's an online uh, uh, surveys that you can take on implicit association, sometimes called implicit bias. Because we've grown up in a society, we all have biases that are unconscious. I do, you do, we all do. And if we become aware of those, we're more likely to be able to recognize that and overcome it. Highly recommend it. The Innovation Law Lab is amazing. It is a crowdsourced group of lawyers, translators, uh, coders, people who, they are all committed to ending isolation and exploitation of immigrants at the border, particular, and refugees, particularly at our southern border. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to know foreign languages to be able to help. Please check it out. So at the end of these talks, I always have two closing statements, and then I'll let my mom have the final word. Interview your elders. I didn't know my grandparents. My grandmother died before I was born. My grandfather died a year after I was born. The only reason I know these stories is they were my mom hand wrote them, then manually typed them, and then wrote the book, and has been sharing these stories with me and, and other people for decades. Today it's so easy. Just pick up your cell phone and start a conversation with your parents or grandparents, aunt and uncle. What was it like growing up? Where, you know, what did you do? They may push you up. Oh, it was not that interesting. No, be persistent. Ask some open-ended questions. I promise you, you will be so grateful to have those recordings especially recordings of their voices after we have passed. This is a great, great project for kids. I can't recommend that highly enough. And finally, speak up for what you know is right. My mom can count on her fingers the number of people in Hood River who helped them during the darkest periods of uh, the 40s and 50s. The Carl Hazel Smiths, Reverend Burgoyne. Speak up for what you know is right. Don't let anybody tell you that your voice and opinion doesn't matter. It does. And it doesn't take a lot. We will never forget these allies. I have cousins named after these people. You can do that too. And it doesn't take a lot. You can do it. I'll let mom have the final word. So my, my message is always, especially when I speak to high school kids, I say, it is not Mrs. Betsworth and the dog that hurt me, it's the good people who knew when something was right and never said anything, never did anything. There were many people who befriended us in private when there was nobody else around except you and me, but if they saw you the next day in town in public, they didn't recognize you. So that's what most people do. And I'm saying the reason I give these talks is to tell you, you need to change your ways. So February is Black History Month, and I think a quote from Martin Luther King is apt. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends.
My mom and I and my family are grateful for your interest. And I'm really grateful that you came. And I would welcome any comments or questions. No question is taboo or off, off base. And I will do my best to answer them. And if I don't know the answer to them, I will research them and post them on my blog. Thank you so much. Yeah, the question is, Executive 90, uh, Order 9066 was in effect until 1976. Was it used against any of the groups? Not to my knowledge. That's a very good question. Um, any or all persons. So it could have been you, me, anybody. Um, that's a very good question. My belief and understanding was only applied against Japanese Americans during World War II. But many got me started. I'm going to have to look it up. So the question is whether or not anything was sim done similarly to Germans and maybe Italian Americans. There were German and Italian Americans who were around them, but the numbers are infinitesimal compared to what happened to Japanese Americans. Estimates for Japanese Americans are between 110 and 120,000 people. For German and Italians, it's probably between 500 and 1,000. Now, why would that be? Yeah, harder fell apart. You know, it's easy to it's easy to recognize somebody of Asian heritage in this country. And for example, a lot of Chinese businesses put a big huge sign, we are Chinese. We're not Japanese Americans. Yes. In terms of that, if anybody has listened to Rich Hamada Ultra, there was so much German collaboration with people like Congress and uh, in general, that they were not, they were not at all, almost at all. Yes, yes. As I said before, there were zero cases of sabotage and espionage committed by Japanese Americans. Ironically, that fact was used to justify the incarceration of Japanese Americans. If you look at the documentation, they'll say, well, we've got all these, you know, tens of thousands of Japanese Americans on the West Coast, and there have been zero cases of sabotage and espionage, which means we really need to round them up and lock them up before it happens, because we know it's going to happen. The absence of the crime means we got to do it even sooner so it stays that way. Yeah, I've written a blog post about the Panama Hotel. Um, if you're lucky enough to meet the owner, she might show you some behind the scenes things, such as uh, there were a lot of Japanese bachelors who lived in that hotel before the war. And the hotel rooms, it's a historic building, didn't have any closets. So the bachelors fashioned wardrobes out of old shipping crates. So some of them, if you slide them out, you'll see labels for like canned fruit, canned vegetables. And in the basement, which is off limits, but if she's there, maybe she, you can talk to her and show you, is an old bathhouse. It was one of the uh, Japanese bathhouses, and all the lockers are numbered in Japanese from right to left. So, yes, going to the Panama Hotel is definitely worth it. That blog post is linked from my February 19th Day of Remembrance blog post, so I'll pull that up again for you. Which way were the guns pointing? I assume you mean in the camps? They pointed Inward. 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 Yes. Yes, it was. So if I understand your question correctly, you're asking, in time of war or chaos, is any form of racial profiling acceptable or not? Is that a fair? Yeah. Um, I guess my response to that would be, 
Profiling based on race should never be acceptable. If there is evidence of uh, malice, of, of crimes being committed, let that be the basis on which you charge somebody, put them through a legal process, and if found guilty, then in prison. There are zero cases of sabotage and espionage committed by Japanese Americans. There are zero charges raised. There are zero court cases and convictions. Now, we know that there were Caucasians, of Italian, German, English, who were sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Now, if we can find evidence that somebody has shared secrets, stolen, let that be the evidence on, on which we base our charges and go through a legal process. Just because somebody looks like the enemy, I don't think is just cause to round up and um, deprive of their civil liberties. That's a very good question. So if I heard you right, after they were released from the camps, were they able to return to their homes? Yes. So my family was, I guess you could call the half percenters. My mom likes to joke that my father, my grandfather was so thrifty, she thinks he had Scottish blood because he owned three farms, they were paid off, he had no mortgage, and he had money in the bank to pay for taxes. So imagine if you were put in jail for three plus years, would you be able to do that? How many people here have their home paid off? How many people here have enough money that if you had no income for three years, you could still hold on to your land, your apartment, your home? The vast majority of people lost everything, everything. And plus, given the cold welcome that they had, or unwelcome, they didn't go home. So my family was extraordinarily fortunate. We didn't lose our farm, we didn't lose our home, and we had sympathetic neighbors. Somebody broke into our house and broke into a closet where stuff was stored. After they got home, people threw rocks in the window and things like that. But no, ours was very fortunate. The vast majority of people lost everything, particularly in California. Mom says, you know, in Hood River, my grandfather said, you know, as a farmer, you will never be rich, but you'll never be hungry. It was enough to be able to sustain the family. If you're doing crops in, in say, the Central Valley, most people didn't own their, their, their land. They'd have to cultivate large swaths of land. They'd have to, like, almost like migrant workers. And they had no home to come home to. So that's a very good question. Yes, so if they couldn't go home, where did they go? Um, there were communities that were really hurting for workers. So for example, with all the able-bodied men off serving, uh, there was this huge shortage of labor for the sugar beet uh, cultivation and harvest. And it was important not only for food, but sugar beets, were used, the, the ingredients were actually used for munitions. Uh, I don't know the chemistry, but sugar beets were helpful in the development, I think, of gunpowder or arms or whatever. So my grandfather left the camp to go work sugar beet farms up in Montana and other states. And Seabrook, New Jersey had a huge, I think it was a, maybe a seafood packing company, and they were hurting for workers. So they, they implored, please come to New Jersey. So there was a large number of Japanese Americans who went to New Jersey where there was work. So they didn't stay where their farms were. Some cases, like, most governors were not happy to have a concentration camp built in their, in their state. They, didn't, they don't want them here. Clearly, they're dangerous, they're unwanted. In some cases, they were won over by the hard work of Japanese American incarcerees who were allowed out of the camp to help do the work, help with the harvest. That happened in Minidoke and Idaho and some other places.
So the question is, what happened in Hawaii? Well, there are so many Japanese Americans there that to round them up and send them away would have just completely been untenable. So the mass incarceration didn't occur there. You may have heard of the famous 442nd Regiment of Combat Team. That was a, uh, a military unit that was uh, formed by Japanese Americans from both Hawaii and also the mainland. There's only Japanese Americans. They were sent to uh, Europe. They are the most decorated military group in US history for its size. They were so-called Purple Heart Battalion because there's so many, there are so many casualties. They rescued the lost Texas Rangers in the Italian Alps. Um, so no, in Hawaii, that was untenable. So they weren't all rounded up because that was been such a huge, uh, huge number of people. I didn't hear the very beginning of your question. I think she was Methodist. Okay. Um, and no, there hasn't been an, a request for for an offering of apology. Seems like that'd be a really good sermon for them to have now, you know, on the whole thing and what yeah. happened now. But yeah. Well, thank you. Um, in the last five, ten years, there's been a lot of healing and. Um, and a apology in the Hoover River community. It did make national news how bad it got. Um, I don't think it's the same church now. I think it's probably gone through a few denominations. There's been at least one or two pastors or ministers in the Hood River, or recent, recent uh, move, recently moved to Hood River, who's really wanted to look into, dive into, acknowledge what happened, um, there's been uh, memorials like the Train of Tears. They had a big celebration, or not celebration, a memorial of the day when all the Japanese Americans were taken to the trains and sent to the, uh, from Hood River to the assembly centers. There's been the Memorial Day uh, ceremony last November, which I attended, which is very moving, during which the American leader formally apologized, presented all the letters. Um, the Idlewild uh, Cemetery, where many Japanese Americans, including my, my grandparents and some of my uncles, they have erected a big huge stone with the names of all the Japanese American soldiers, not just the 16 that have included two of my uncles, but of, of all of I believe, maybe all of Hood or maybe all of Oregon. Oregon. So I, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, so how did my four uncles did? They, they all survived. None was injured. Um, my mom's the youngest of eight kids. She's going to be 91. I'm the youngest with a, a nine-year spread. So unfortunately, by the time I got to the age where I had a lot of questions, many of my aunts and uncles either either passed or were not lucid. There's so many questions I could have asked. So at the funeral, at the memorial for my oldest uncle Todd, um, a story came out that made people actually laugh during the memorial. So he came in the Hood River, he's in his dress uniform, he walks into a store, I don't know what kind of store it was, and the young clerk said, I'm sorry sir, I can't, I can't serve you, they had a no jab trade sign. And he's like, and he was as good natured, like, okay, he turned around and started walking, I was like, I'm really sorry sir. And he's like, oh no, don't worry about it, I'm actually Chinese. <laughs> Everybody laughed, that was my uncle talk. He was unclappable, but, well, I've heard stories that once in a while he would have kind of this faraway look and say, I wonder, he talked about the most, the luckiest guy in his platoon. There's this one guy, they played poker and he'd always win. 
you can always take all the money from all of his colleagues. And, you know, they're doing the jungle island hopping, jungle rock, all sorts of terrible stuff. And one day that fellow stepped on a landmine. Instantly it was gone. My, my uncle said, and it was the luckiest guy in the team. So, I wish. This is why you should interview your aunts and uncles, your grandparents. Please do that. Did all the barracks get torn down, or there's still some standing? So after the camps were disbanded, like my mom, my, my dad kind of pressured my mom into making a road trip in the 60s to the location of the old camps. And there was zero trace, not even a stone. The barracks were sold to farmers and other people. Um, some of them have been reclaimed, like at, at Harm Mountain, Wyoming, they have brought some back in and restored them. They've built some new ones to kind of mimic what they're like. Um, yeah, so there, several of them are like National Historic Monuments now. I highly recommend you visit them. I'm in Adoka near Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, Hard Mountain is just 10 minutes outside of Cody, um, to the lake. Yeah. What's the population of Wyoming, Wyoming of Japanese Americans? Uh, pretty, I think it's pretty low. I don't think. Like an earlier question asked, did some people stay near the past? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, there are three Supreme Court cases that you should look up. So, Minnesota versus U.S. was to fight the constitutionality of the curfew before the incarceration. He lost. Um, and, yeah, that's an issue. Um, um, Fred Korematsu, I think he, I think his case was against the uh, incarceration. And, just help me out, there's a third one. Can't remember. Um, if you like podcasts, there's one called More Perfect, which is about the history of the Supreme Court. There is a fantastic podcast about Fred Koromansu. He fought, lost as well. His daughter is in high school or college, and they're going and they're talking about incarceration, and then they talk about this Koromansu versus U.S. And they all look at her and like, are you related? It was her father. He had, she had no idea. Um, it's a really interesting story. So yes, there were three Supreme Court cases. They all went down. And the late uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, one of the most, one of the very conservative justices, um, when asked, could this happen again? I don't know Latin. He recited Latin phrase and said, yes, it could happen again in times of war. You know, all, all logic and law, you know, law just dissipates. Something to that effect. I'm not doing it justice. So was there an actual resistance? And that's a very good question, because for years and decades, Japanese Americans, certainly when I was in high school, were referred to as the model minority. We were docile and compliant. We followed the rules. We did good in school, all that sort of stuff. In more recent times, the history of resistance has come up. And there were some examples, particularly in Tule Lake, uh, when that loyalty questionnaire came out, it tore families apart. Some were saying, we need to be 100% loyal. We should serve. We should prove our loyalty. We'll prove how loyal we are, and that will, that will convince them to let us go. Other people said, no, I know my constitutional rights. They don't give a darn about us. Screw you. They were in Tule Lake. There were hunger strikes. 
There were protests. They were brutally beaten down. There was torture in that um, in that uh, stockade. There were like 10 or 20 guys. I I I have to pull it up who refused to answer the, the uh, questionnaire at all. And if memory serves, they were uh, threatened with a $10,000 fine, which back then was a heck of a lot more than it is today, and many years in prison, just for refusing to answer the questionnaires. And there were protests in all the different camps over the, the questionnaire. And what story I didn't talk about was renunciation. So after all the, and they were called the no-no boys. Nice, um, and there's a book called No-No Boy. When all the no-no boys were sent to Tule Lake, and Tule Lake became this hotbed of protest and uprising, the government said, we want to deport these troublemakers. Well, you can't deport a US citizen. So Congress passed the Renunciation Act which allowed you to renounce your citizenship. Over 5,000 people did that. Now, why would you renounce your citizenship? Well, imagine you're in camp, one, two years. Some people said, well, gosh, mom and dad are aliens. They can't become these citizens. They're probably going to be deported. Let, well, let's renounce our citizenship. We'll all stay, stay together. Well, clearly my citizenship doesn't matter for anything. Screw this. Gosh, this war is taking a long time. This is all censored. I wonder if Japan's winning the war. Maybe we should renounce our citizenship and go back to Japan. Over 5,000 people renounced their citizenship. Some people were deported to Japan and were stuck there for 10, 20 years before they could get back. There's one single ACLU lawyer, Wayne Collins, who fought for over 20 years and got those renunciations overturned. Look him up. He's, he's incredible. So long, long answer to a short question, yes, there were uprisings, yes, there was protest, and only recently has that history started to come up uh, a lot.